who is a is a member of the Door County Master Gardeners. And uh, if you're not interested in, uh, familiar with the system, just about every county in the state uh, has a chapter. And uh, she's been very active in the Garden Door for uh, several years now. To me, the Garden Door is one of the best gardens in the state. And one of the big reasons for that is that you can look at a section of the garden and translate that into, uh, into your own space. You go to many of the other uh, gardens and they're just so big that it is difficult to envision putting that within your own, uh, own area. Um, I, as Melanie said, our season is coming to a close and we are organizing for next year. And we're always looking for ideas. So if you have a topic that you'd like us to cover, you can contact the uh, Appleton Library or Master Gardeners at gardnersos at outagamey.org and uh, we'll get back to you. So now with that, I am going to drop off the screen and turn it over to Sue. Thank you so much, Tom and Melanie. I appreciate your invitation to speak to all of you today. I am Sue Kunz from the Door County Master Gardener Volunteers. So welcome to the Garden Door. And I'm going to see if I can just get this there. Um, the Garden Door is located on Highway 42, just north of Sturgeon Bay at the Peninsular Agricultural Research Station. It's a mouthful to say, so we always refer to it as PARS. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Garden Door origins date back to 1995 when the Door County Master Gardeners decided that they would like to establish a show garden. 10 years later, um, in July of 2005, they held their open house, a uh, grand opening. And the garden is, as Tom mentioned, many different types of gardens to allow a gardener the opportunity to decide what and how they could plant in their yard. So there it's on one acre of land and it's divided into 20 different garden areas. Each one is um, taken care of by all of the master gardeners, but they have a supervisor for each garden and um, they determine what they want to plant and how they want to design it and the maintenance of it. The funds to maintain the garden door comes from the proceeds earned at our annual plant sale, which occurs in May at the research station and from funds in the donation box located in the garden door. Unfortunately, due to the COVID, we have not had the plant sale for the past two years, um, but we're still doing fine. The garden door contains approximately 350 different varieties of plants. And you can see our plant list by going to our website, dcmga.org, click on the garden door, and the garden areas, and you can see a plant list of all of the plants that are there. <clears throat> the gardens are planted and maintained by our member volunteers, and we provide approximately 2,000 volunteer hours each gardening season. Um, so let's get started and take a walk through the garden door. So as you enter through that trellis, um, which is covered with wisteria and uh, climbing roses, you enter into our rose garden. Um, the rose garden encompasses a fairly large area. And on the east side of the rose garden are the rugosa roses, which are those old fashioned rose bushes that develop uh, those beautiful rose hips in midsummer and turn to that orange and then that deep red by late fall. 
So the rugosas, when they're in bloom, have that incredible fragrant old fashioned rose smell that we kind of equate with. And um, so here are the rugosa roses. We've got pinks and whites. Um, there's a white here in the background that you can see. And then this here in the background is a uh, Kusa dogwood. And in the far background, you see our um, gazebo. On the east side of the rose garden um, is the um, another section. And this is the day of our spring cleanup. And last year, we weren't able to get into the garden until July 2nd. Uh, it was not open to the public at all. Many people were still a bit nervous due to the whole COVID crisis of even coming up once we were allowed entrance, even though it's on an acre of land. Um, so the weeds really took hold. You can imagine how aggressive weeds can get when there's nobody digging them up and it's an irrigated system. So this is what we were faced with um, in early May. Uh, you can hardly see all those beautiful tulips and daffodils that are in bloom with the lamium and the wood violets and the Johnny jump ups and all of the dandelions. So we tackled this area. I put 10 gardeners in here to get it completely weeded out. And this is what we came up with by June 21st. So completely weeded out. Um, we then bordered the entire rose garden on this west side with lavender. Um, Hidcoat and Munstead alternating. Those are two lavenders that I think do incredibly well here. I've always had very good luck with them and they will fill in beautifully within the next year or two. We added three more rose bushes and looking to probably add a couple of carpet rose bushes to fill in more of that open space. We've also added some phlox uh, as phlox, um, clematis, lavender, and nepeta are all very lovely companion plants to roses. So over the next few years, there'll be even more changes. Then going on, we have a pond. So this is our pond garden. And unfortunately our pump um, malfunctioned in the towards the end of May and the pump has been on back order since then so we still don't have a functioning pond garden um, so um, but this was a picture from last year with the koi we have decided not to keep the koi to try to have it more of a biodiverse pond uh, we will be adding some pond plants once we get that pump working and um, encourage the tadpoles and frogs and toads. Um, the birds love this area. And then the gardens around the pond, we've got a fat Albert blue spruce, um, some ground cover. This tree unfortunately was lost. Um, it had split and so that has now gone. And here you'll notice throughout the talk as you we wander through the garden that I will throw in some winter interest photos. I love walking through the garden in the winter time and this just gives you a whole different feel and element of what the gardens look like in the winter. And now our cactus garden and yes there are cactus that are hardy in the midwest. Uh, the prickly pear and then the Echinocereus, also called a king cup cactus or the prairie hedgehog. They are bl in bloom in June, mid-June into early, early July. And they are absolutely exquisite um, at that time of year. The fence right behind the cactus garden here uh, defines the area between the cactus garden and the west perennial bed. That fence was just built a year ago by one of our master gardeners. All of the structures and buildings, except for the gazebo, have been built by master gardeners, um, as well as the glasswork that you will be seeing 
and all of the mosaic benches. So we have a very talented group of people that love to sh um, showcase their artistic talents as well as their fabulous gardening capabilities and skills. So um, if you visit us almost any time from spring until late fall, you'll see something in bloom. Then going on, we have the pergola. This was taken last fall. One can tell that because the American Bittersweet has that beautiful orange berry on it already. But on the um, pergola, we've got not only the American Bittersweet, we have two varieties of honeysuckle, one being a variegated and the other um, just the regular honeysuckle. Uh, climbing hydrangea was just recently planted two years ago. So that's really just starting to take off. And then we have one of my favorite plants, oops, excuse me, I just went backwards, um, the a Dutchman's pipe, which is a host for the pipeline swallowtail. But what I love about this plant is in early, mid-June, you see the tiny little flower that looks like a Dutchman's pipe, hence the name, um, right here. But you have to go searching for it. You have to know that it's there because it's hidden behind those very large heart-shaped leaves. And then we have our fairy and toad abode. This is for the kids. They love going into the toad abode. It is hollowed out the inside of the cedars that are on the border of the gardens. Um, it's just a small little section. They can go in one side and tunnel through and come out the other way. There's all sorts of little trinkets, fairies hanging from the trees, little fairy garden type accessories in there. And we do have a couple of uh, plastic keeper boxes that have uh, books that are age appropriate on gardening for the children. So it's probably on a hot day, it's sometimes five to eight degrees cooler in there. So it's a nice spot for them to go and get a little shade and out of the sun. Then we have our raised garden beds. And again, these beds were designed and created by one of our master gardeners. We use, we get the seeds from the Door County Seed Library, which was just started about three years ago and is going very strong. I believe you've got a seed library in Appleton as well. Um, so these vegetable beds are planted and tended by a group of master gardeners. They harvest the crops and donate the food to a local food pantry. And then some of the vegetables are left to go to seed so that they can then uh, give those seeds back to the seed library. Um, it's fun to watch those gardens develop throughout the season. And just again, a little bit of winter interest. We've, they put some pumpkins out there in a cornucopia just to add some pop and color to the winter garden. Then usually into December, they'll hang a, a wreath that's got Christmas decorations on it. And then you can see in the background, the lovely grass garden, which will come to shortly. And then here's our espalier apple tree. It's a Liberty variety. It's against our shed. Um, the garden shed, which again was designed and built by master gardeners. But this is just a nice display of how to do an espalier tree. And here's a lovely spring picture of it with a blossom. And then moving on, we go to our pollinator garden and those metal sculpture butterflies were created by yet another one of our master gardeners. This is a little early in the season for the pollinator garden. There's a few things in bloom, um, but um, right now it's almost not quite in full bloom because the asters aren't blooming yet, but we do have butterfly weed here in the forefront. We've got some echinaceas. We've got some rebecchias in bloom. Looks like these golden rods are just getting ready to bloom. In the background, there's a purple smoke bush. So as I said, come at any time of the season and there will be something in bloom. 
So here's a broader picture of the pollinator garden. The Joe Pye weed is in bloom in this picture. The asters are blooming here. We've got some sedum down here in bloom. Um, wild quinine is over here. There's a um, little blue stem here. We've got some prairie drop seed right to the front. Um, and as I said, you can go to our plant list and see the names of all of the different plants that are there. Over here is a small pergola that one of the gardeners built. And that was to create just enough shade for the few uh, grasses that prefer to have shade. Um, so there's some hackanacola grass in there, blue zinger, some of the different sedges that um, need shade rather than the full sunny garden that the grass garden is in. Here's just a corner of one of the mosaic benches that's been created and designed. Then this is one of, this is the West perennial garden bed. They're all gar perennial beds, but this is just called the West perennial garden. Um, and right now the lilies have just finished blooming. The rudbeckias, the coneflowers, the monarda are now in full bloom. The um, coral bells, I was just out there yesterday and the coral bells are sort of hidden by everything that's kind of covering over them. Um, the asters have not started blooming yet. And then in the background, this is the backside of the raised beds. And then across from the raised beds, there's a container garden area. And then this copper structure that holds um, some vertical garden beds of um, framed gardens of succulent gardens. This is early on in that perennial bed. So the Maltese cross are in full bloom. The daisies haven't started blooming yet. The nadia hasn't bloomed yet. It is in bloom now. The nadia is a burgundy colored flower that looks very similar to a scabiosa. And let's see what else is in this garden. Oops, went back again, sorry about that. Um, and here the Menarda and the daisies are just about finished at this time. As I said earlier, we really got behind the eight ball because of not being able to, not many people coming up to the garden last year and weeding out. So some of these gardens we've completely dug up this perennial bed and I'm going, I am going to go back one. This bed was completely, this section of the bed was completely dug out this summer, early summer, and to get all of the weeds out and then replanted because it was in, completely invaded with weeds. So um, we still have another at least half of that garden to, um, to weed out, but it started blooming and we didn't want to destroy all the flowers that were in bloom. Um, this is a view of the memorial garden. This is the tunnel and a dome in the background. It's just an exquisite garden. So this garden encompasses the perennial beds here and here on both sides of this tunnel. Um, so back here, you see some Amsonia, there's Baptisias, there are Iris that are in bloom here. Um, there's some Estrancha here. It's just packed with um, blooms. So here's a view of the Memorial Garden looking straight down the tunnel. What you see here in the forefront, uh, this picture was taken a number of years ago. This was part of the annual student garden beds, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but this Memorial Garden is, the tunnel is um, climbing, uh, clematis are climbing across both sides of the tunnel. Um, and when those are in bloom, it's just absolutely exquisite. There's dark purple, there's burgundy, there's white. Uh, it's just beautiful garden. Here we are in early spring with the tulips in bloom. You can see the variegated iris, the geraniums, which haven't started blooming yet. Um, and then 
all of this glass work, this is fused glass, which one of many of the master gardeners have taken fused glass classes. One of our master gardener, um, a couple um, used to have a studio that was available to anybody that wanted to come up and take classes and do glass work. They've now retired, uh, aren't open for all of us to join in. They're just busy doing their own artwork. Um, but many of us took advantage of going up to the studio and making glass work. So the woman who was in charge of this garden for a number of years did all sorts of uh, glass work to um, install. Unfortunately, about a week after she had installed all of the glass work, there was one of those freak summer hailstorms that damaged many of the glass pieces. But what she did is picked up all of the glass that was broken on the ground and refused it and incorporated it into other glass pieces. So it just is a spectacular view to see how that tunnel is adorned with that, those glass works. Um, some Estrancha um, major in bloom. Um, I'll talk a little more about this here. This is a Kibia five leaf vine, which we found out was on the prohibited list of plants from the Wisconsin DNR. So we have been working with the Door County invasive team to er eradicate that. That is um, a three year long process. Um, this was all taken down last year. We had completely removed everything from the dome. So this is what grew back after chemically treating it. So it's quite aggressive and um, a difficult one to take care of. So here is a picture, a close up of one of the clematis in full bloom. You can see a spider wart here in the background. And here's a close up of some of that glass work and then driftwood that was also used to kind of cover the, the poles and of the um, tunnel structure itself. More of that glass work, which just adds another element of beauty to the gardens themselves. And the tulips in bloom and those beautiful variegated irises. Once again, I threw in my winter definition. A few years ago, in fact, the year that I was a student, so that was in 2018, um, I knew that the Amsonia had already finished blooming because Amsonia has a tiny little blue star-like flower on the plant. And I noticed this very large white flower from a distance. So on closer investigation, here it was a clematis that had managed to grow its way into the Amsonia. So we decided to leave that. Well, then last winter when I was out taking pictures for a talk on winter garden events in the garden door, here is the clematis vine and the dried seed head of the blossom itself. So it's interesting what you can see in a winter garden. So, so if you've never toured a garden in the winter time, take a chance and take the opportunity to do so because it really is quite exquisite. So here's just a larger view of the east side of the Memorial Garden, um, Selvia, Heliopsis, so Heliopsis, Selvias, Spiderwort, all in bloom. There's a uh, black lace elderberry here, um, the smoke bush in the distance. And here is the peony garden, which we'll talk about in a moment, all in bloom. And then here's a gallardia down here. So our fairy garden, which is a treat for the children as well as adults. The ladies are just starting to get that replanted and all the little figurines in there. Um, everybody always has fun doing that. Each year or every couple of years, they change up the theme and what they put in the fairy garden. This particular year, the theme was the um, things to see around Door County or the, the um, 
treasures that one can find. So camping at Peninsula, <coughs> excuse me, camping at Peninsula or Potawatomi Park. The farm, which is a fun place for children to go um, just north of Sturgeon Bay as well. And then the drive-in theater, which is about mm, just right outside of Egg Harbor. <clears throat> and then moving on to the grass garden, this is a sunrise view, the east. So this is a grass garden that probably was maybe mid, early mid-July. Um, and then this beautiful structure here in the background. Again, yet another thing that was built by master gardeners. This woman, uh, <clears throat> I met doing one of the tours at the garden door. She was um, from a retirement, uh, with a retirement group. And during conversation, I found out that she was um, a master gardener from Door County and come to find out she is one of the women that helped design and build the structure that she's standing in front of. And they, we call this the Wentz. So it was delightful to talk with her about that design and what they had done. She also informed me that um, that was the year that she had had her pacemaker put in. So they wouldn't allow her to touch any of the power tools. So it was kind of fun and it was delightful to visit with her. Here's the grass garden more in its glory when all those plumes are in bloom. Um, you can tell that it's kind of a windy day. Everything is blowing. Um, it's a wind from the south. And, um, but it's just even on a gentle breezy day to watch those blooms um, drifting back and forth in the wind. Uh, here's Japanese blood grass to the front. We've got oat grass here. We've got some, looks like little blue stem here. There's blue fescue, there's some penstemon. Um, so again, go to our website. All of those grasses are listed in the um, plant lists. Um, here's the, the bottle tree. The bottle tree has a very interesting um, history. Years ago, uh, it was believed that by hanging bottles in a tree, evil spirits would find their way into the bottles and then become stuck. And since they wouldn't be able to find their way back out again, they would remain in the bottle until morning when the morning sun would then destroy the spirits. And blue, specifically the cobalt blue, is by far the most popular color for bottle trees. And the belief is that these particular bottles have healing powers. So in folklore, People tend to associate the color blue with ghosts and spirits, which makes it even more popular for um, those trees. So it gives a nice pop and added interest, as well as all these different plumes of these grasses. And again, my winter interest has to pop in there. So here's that fence that was just recently made. Um, this is right in the cactus garden would be right here. This is the West Perennial and then our, our grass garden. And look how nicely that, that fence and this fence complement each other. And then of course our um, gazebo. So the annual student beds, um, because we haven't had students for two years now due to the COVID, um, those two beds have just remained um, dormant. We did put a cover crop of rye grass just to have something in there so that wasn't just all weeds. But uh, the students in the past, what we've done is they create, design and create two beds using all annuals. And it's um, a lot of fun. Uh, all of the annuals are what we grow in the greenhouses that we sell then at the annual plant sale, but the students um, grow their own as well for in their gardens. And then they tend those gardens throughout the year. The year I was a student, I was sort of overtaken like, oh my gosh, to do two entire garden beds all in annuals. Um, I'm not particularly fond of all annuals. I'm much more of the perennial gardener. Um, so it was a challenge to me, but you have to step outside of the box and learn. But the following year I helped on the training program and I thought it would be 
fun to do one flower bed and one vegetable bed so that as students, they could learn a bit more and have hands-on experience with vegetable gardening as well. So then that's what we did for two years um, of, of the annual beds, one being flowers and one being a vegetable bed. So that was the following year, another set of students, they were setting up their designs and getting ready to create their garden beds. Then we move on to the peony garden. In the peony garden, we have um, the three different varieties, the herbaceous, the intersectional, and tree peonies. This garden has also, along with that, many varieties of daylilies and um, lots of other perennials that are in bloom from the beginning of the season till the end. Here you see some ligularia. Um, there's ladies mantle in there. Um, the lemon drop on a thera. Um, so again, come, come early and come often and you'll see all sorts of things coming and going. We lost the, the stump of the tree. So we lost a crab apple that was here. And just this year, we planted a Minnesota strain red bud um, in the garden. And um, in fact, that's right here. So just a young sapling that in years to come, we will have an absolutely exquisite red bud in the, in the garden. Um, here we have our rock garden with hypertufas. If you're not familiar with hypertufas, it's three parts peat and three parts perlite and then Portland cement. There are YouTube videos out there on how to make hypertufas. Hypertufas can remain outside. They withstand temperatures up to, uh, I think it's between 20 and 30 below. There are even some plants hardy enough that survive being in the hypertufa. Um, they're a lovely element, a different structure and design to add to your garden. And then another view of um, early summer in the rock garden. Moving on, we have our herb garden. Um, these pictures are from early, early on number of years ago uh, when it was first being established. Um, it's quite heavily filled in now, but again, part of that was the toll of two years of, of not being able to get up there and, and do much work in the garden. But we've got Comfrey and Love Age, um, black, uh, Bronze Fennel, Dill, um, tansy. Um, this was hops over this arbor. The arbor um, suffered damage due to just years of wear and tear, but winds and then the weight of the hops literally tipped it over last year. So we've removed that arbor and the gardener that's the supervisor for this particular area is thinking of designing a new trellis to put in there and would like to have some type of a rustic design. This is our human sundial garden. It's in the thyme garden. So we have multiple varieties of thyme, as you can see, but what you can't see are the numbers for the sundial, the human sundial garden. You should Google human sundials. It's fascinating. Ours is designed just for daylight savings time. And then the woman is standing right in front of the directions of how to do it. Um, you put one foot on the present month and then the other foot just across the center line. Put your hands up over your head as she's doing in this picture. And then at the top of the hands in the shadow um, will be the number of the stone and that will tell you the time. Um, everybody loves it, children and adults. It's great fun to use the human sundial. Right behind her is the succulent garden, which is right here. That is filled with um, 
all sorts of succulents. And as you can see, there's hypertufas in here as well. Um, there's the Millennium Allium, um, pops of color with the green planters. And um, trying to do a beautiful establishment of multiple different colors, alternating colors of the sedums. Um, the greens tend to always try to take over. So it's always a challenge for the people who design this garden to get the darker colors reestablished uh, because the, the other more common varieties of sedum like to just kind of push those uh, pretty dark varieties out. But here you can see a nice um, view of the other gardens in the background. The thyme garden here in full bloom, all those different colors of purples and whites. And then the herb garden here. And here is that rock garden that we've already visited. And then once again, I have to throw in my winter definition. So that great pop of green color, which you may or may not really catch your eye in the, the, this seasonal garden, but then when you have it in the, the winter garden, look at how that bright pop of green just makes that winter scene feel a little warmer. Moving on to our shade garden. Um, this is another garden that is going major transfer, transformation renovation this year. Um, we lost several shade trees, so they're adding in to um, offer shade to the plants that need the shade. Um, here is a lovely area underneath these Japanese um, lilac trees to sit on a bench to just enjoy the beauty of the gardens, relax in the shade, um, lots of hostas, semifugias, um, a Daphne Mackey is over here. I have another picture of that in full bloom. Um, so here we are, the Carol Mackey in full bloom, a lot of ajuga. There's a red twig dogwood here. Um, there's a golden spirit smoke bush. I had never seen a, a golden colored smoke bush, but that's quite pretty. Um, I've always known about the purple smoke bushes. Um, right in here, we just planted a fountain beach, which I'm really excited about because it has those weeping arms that go every which way. So in a few years from now, that will fill in nicely, offer a bit more shade for those ligularias. And then right here, can't really see it, but through this clump of red twig dogwood, uh, they just recently planted a royal frost birch, which will be quite lovely with that purple contrast. And then behind that, um, right on the edge of this particular garden is an iron wood. So then we will really have filled in um, nicely to give more shade to the hostas, the variegated Solomon seals, the lady mantle, ladies mantle, um, and all of the other plants that really need that shade. This is a little quick fire. The darker, these are, this is early spring. So these are the blossoms from last year, which is difficult to trim off when the tree is six feet tall. Um, but we did get some of those trimmed back. And then the nice mulch paths that are just edged periodically with stone to just give some definition. And then here in the background are some allium that are in bloom. And the dwarf conifer garden is the most recent garden uh, that was put in in 2016, I believe. So lots of different varieties of um, dwarf conifers. <clears throat> the garden next door is a plot of garden beds that are available to Master Gardener volunteers and to the research station employees if they want to have a vegetable plot. It's 10 by 20. And the soil there is extremely fertile and it's just a lovely place to have a spot for a vegetable garden. Um, this is one of our friendly 
swallowtail caterpillars eating away on dill. And just the gardens in many different stages, but everybody maintains their gardens beautifully. A lot of people even plant flowers, not only to kind of make the gardens pop a little more, but also to bring in beneficial insects and pollinators. Uh, the only thing that we ask of the gardeners is that they donate some of their harvest to the local food pantries, which all of them willingly do. So we have many different events during the summer. Um, touched a little on the plant sale, which we haven't had for two years. We always have a spring cleanup when we get 30, 40, 50 people coming into the garden to help get the garden ready to open up. We usually have an annual open house. We did not do so this year. It takes planning and not knowing with the COVID restrictions early on if we were going to be able to do that. Tuesday evenings in the garden door, we do one Tuesday a month. Uh, that too is another that just got set on the side burner for this year, but it's, we have um, short lecture series that are held in the garden door. The plein air festival, we hosted one day of artists in the garden. Um, that did go on this year. Last year it had to be canceled. So they asked if we would be on their calendar for this year, which we did. And it was a great success. We have Monday morning coffee in the garden and weeding Wednesdays, which are for the master gardeners to come up and help maintain and, and keep the gardens looking nice. We do offer tours and then we also have our fall cleanup. So here's some random pictures of our plant sale. As you can see, we've got signage that not only tells what the plant is, but what the variety is, how to care for it. We have master gardeners that we're all wearing our name badges and um, able to tell the people um, that are there purchasing how to care for their plants and what to do. So it's a great plant sale, but it's also an educational event. Spring cleanup. Everybody's hard at work. Spring cleanup usually requires more time than fall cleanup because we believe that leaving the plants up in the fall gives um, food for the birds and uh, harbor for the insects for the winter months. So spring cleanup requires a bit more work, but when you have a lot of people in the garden working at it, it can happen pretty quickly. This is from a couple of years ago, one of our Tuesday evening in the garden lecture series. This woman was demonstrating how to um, plant a fall planter. Most of our planters start to get a little scraggly looking by the end of the summer and she was doing a fall planting. Some of the plants she used were perennials that she was going to just put in for temporarily and then to transplant them, but to just give a nice pop for an event that was coming up. Um, and here's a picture from our, the plein air festival that we just had on July 27th. It was a lot of fun. We had over 200 visitors in the garden and there were 10 artists that set up um, to paint different areas. And they just chose whatever area they wanted to go to. And it was very interesting because there were probably four or five different artists that, um, wanted to paint our garden shed and each one looked totally different. And here's an open house from years past. And you can see that our paved paths are completely wheelchair accessible. And there's our beautiful garden shed in the background. One year at the open house, we had leftover annuals from the plant sale. So we decided to plant them in one of the garden plots and um, by the time the open house would come along, we figured we'd have enough flowers from a cutting garden to sell bouquets um, at the open house as a fundraiser. Everybody loved it. The people buying them, we let them just decide what they wanted in their arrangement and we would arrange, we'd have pre-arrangements and if they wanted to have flowers added or us to make something right on the spot, it was a great, um, success and a lot of fun to do. 
So another way to raise money. Um, here's our fall cleanup in the garden door and our crew of volunteers. And we always like to have food afterwards. So we have a luncheon provided, um, soup and bread and cheese and desserts um, for after a hard day, hard morning of work. Now, some just random pictures throughout the garden. This is a close up of that pagoda dogwood that I mentioned when we were talking about the rose garden. It's just exquisite. That blooms in probably mid late June. Again, my winter interest because I love going there in the winter scene. It was just after a fresh fallen snow. So you can still see that snow capped on all of those plants. And um, once you start really becoming familiar with your plants in the springtime and summer and know what they are, you can actually recognize them in the winter. So here we've got goldenrod. Here we've got our cone flowers. Um, our Amsonia, our Baptisia, of course, our Clematis. So it was great fun. It's great fun going up there in the winter as well. So here we have our Viburnum in the summer and our Viburnum in the winter. And then our Espaliate apple tree. And here we have it. The water was dripping off the roof and forming these beautiful long icicles. And then this is just a view, an overall view um of the garden from north looking south even on a cloudy day look at how all those colors jump out at you and the um i mean you can your eye can pick up so many different shades and shadows and colors the purples and the yellows and the greens and um, the variegated plants um, so even on a fall, uh, cloudy day it's fun to go up there so here is that Akebia vine before we knew that it was an invasive plant that we had to take down. So you can see how it was completely covering that dome and all of that scroll work. Um, Here's some of the glass work that uh, Wendy had made and then how it just complements those wooden structures as well. And then here are the mosaic benches that I had mentioned earlier. Um, this was a newly added feature to our garden. We've got people who do metal work. We have people who do glass work. So they decided to um, create a, a donation box that stood out a little more. Um, and after this was installed, the donations in this box probably for sure doubled, almost tripled what was in um, where our other donation box was located, which was just as you were exiting uh, of the garden door at the other side of the arbor where, or the trellis, which I will show you in a moment. So have a totally awesome day. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and attention. Um, and yes, this was an actual picture. This is not photoshopped. We opened up the donation box one day and I wasn't paying attention, but as I opened it, I felt something on my hand. Um, and every time we open up this donation box, we're greeted by this little fellow. So apparently this is his place of residence and we just let him be. <laughs>